Sounds perfect. Yeah, yeah, of course, no problem. And thank you for organizing all of this. It's, uh, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, all these talks uh, and also the possibility to see it again in the in Facebook or in other. Uh, it's really nice. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you think you it will uh, go on until uh, December or? Uh... Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Link. OK, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to uh, present um, the next speaker, Giorgio Quer. Um, he is a IEEE Distinguished Lecturer of IEEE Communications Society. He's also an assistant professor, PhD, director of Artificial Intelligence at Scripps Research Translational Institute, San Diego, California. And today, uh, today's talk is co-organized by IEEE Young Professionals Norway and also IEEE Communication Society Young Professionals. The title of this talk is uh, Digital Medicine with Sensors from resting heart rate and sleep analysis to outbreak prediction. Thank you, Giorgio. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Beatrice, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, really nice uh, uh, event and series of, uh, of talks. Uh, so uh, what I want to uh, present today is really our view on, on digital medicine and uh, what we can do uh, with sensor by analyzing uh, this rich amount of data and, and really how we use it in, uh, in, in different tasks. And uh, at the very end, we can also help uh, in predicting uh, the outbreak and help in some way uh, to address this emergency of uh, COVID. So I would like to start, uh, well, first of all, thanking um, IEEE, uh, the Communication Society, uh, and, and also the different technical committees that, uh, that, are, that have been supporting me through uh, the past years from the EPEL technical committee, uh, the cognitive network and the communication system integration and modeling uh, that have been supported to pretty my position as a distinguished lecturer in the past uh, few years. So um, I would like to start really uh, giving a brief overview of uh, what is my role and, and my career and how I ended up really working in digital medicine. So um, I started uh, as uh, I have a PhD in electrical and computer engineering. Um, I, I worked really um, several years in uh, remote sensing um, at the University of Padova and in different problems with uh, wireless networks including uh, cooperation. Uh, I spent a, a short period of time at the, the University of Oldo in uh, Finland. And uh, about almost 10 years ago, I moved to the University of California, San Diego, where I started working with a slightly different type of sensor, uh, this portable or wearable sensors. Uh, first, uh, from a wireless perspective, and later on, I got more and more interested in uh, the kind of signals that uh, we can uh, sense with this uh, sensors. Um, after uh, a while, I, I figured out that uh, our technical capabilities and um, our signal processing expertise was really not enough to make an impact. And so um, 
I moved basically really close by and I'm still in San Diego to the Scripps Research Translational Institute, uh, where I can work directly on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with cardiologists and other clinical experts together with data scientists and, and uh, technical people like, uh, like myself, and like I think most of us uh, attending this talk. So uh, this really, uh, you know, um, brings us a new dimension for analyzing these signals and new expertise that we can leverage to make really an impact. So this is a little bit about my career. Uh, now I would like to start uh, by saying a couple of words about this emergency, this COVID-19 emergency, and uh, we'll see uh, through the talk how we can um, address uh, this, this big problem and potentially propose some, uh, some solution. So, uh, well, COVID-19, uh, we all know it's, uh, uh, it's a terrible pandemic that really uh, went through the whole world. Um, it became, um, in, in the US, as you can see from this figure, um, the number one cause of death, this is back to the month of, I think, April, um, it surpasses really heart disease and cancer in number of deaths uh, in, in, in that month. It is, uh, luckily, I would say, uh, the situation is a little bit better in, in Europe. Uh, you know, I come from Italy, so I was extremely concerned the past few months, uh, especially uh, for my relatives that are in the north part of, uh, of, of Italy. Um, in Europe, it's a little bit better now. Uh, it's a really huge problem in the US, in particular in the area where I come from, South California, which we are experiencing a really huge number of uh, uh, new cases um, every day. Um, now, uh, we, we really need to find uh, some sort of solutions uh, to, to address this pandemic and to potentially stop it. So uh, the classical one and probably the most effective one is uh, test, trace and isolate, uh, which really means testing um, as many people as possible, tracing uh, whatever is happening and isolating, of course, these people. This is uh, effective, uh, but it's, uh, of course, a huge cost and uh, not always applicable uh, in, in a population with 300 plus million people. Uh, we cannot really test everyone uh, every day um, because uh, that would be really the, the solution uh, of that. So we need to find new ways uh, to, um, to address uh, this, uh, this situation. Um, a couple of days ago, um, I've been, uh, I, I went to a shop actually for my laptop and uh, at the entrance of the shop, uh, they uh, measured my temperature. Uh, this seems to be a really the a sort of rudimental type of um, testing that we do um, just to measure if someone has fever. And uh, of course, if it has fever, um, you cannot enter the shop and you should, uh, well, you should pay attention of, of what is happening. Now, um, it has been shown that this is not a great solution. Um, what I'm showing here is a paper from um, uh, King's College London. Um, it has been published in Nature Medicine uh, I think at the beginning of May. And it's, it's a great study uh, looking at uh, different uh, symptoms and how uh, they are um, related to COVID. Uh, there are more than 2 million people between uh, the UK and the US that participated in this study. And um, as we can see here, there are, uh, well, some um, symptoms that are really uh, predictive, like the loss of uh, um, taste and smell, uh, but fever, which is the objective symptoms that we can really uh, measure, uh, is, is not really predictive. Um, it is present in about 30, in, uh, around 30% 30 of people who tested positive for um, COVID. So these are people which, who are symptomatic, uh, who did a test and tested positive. Um, if we look, uh, this is not the whole picture. Of course, we should also consider, we know that uh, COVID is often asymptomatic and can still be contagious. And uh, the number of asymptomatics uh, are, the percentage of asymptomatics is actually really huge. Uh, this is a great study from um, a colleague of mine, uh, Danny Oran at uh, Scripps Research, uh, just published, uh, I think a month ago in the Annals of Internal Medicine. 
uh, he was basically looking back at uh, uh, many different studies uh, published in the literature and the, the percentage of asymptomatic uh, people uh, that, that are positive for COVID. This goes anywhere between 30 and up to 90% for some studies. So uh, we can reasonably say that this, is, uh, this number is around 50% approximately. And so we still have, you know, one people out of two who have COVID but no symptoms. And among people who have symptoms, still three out of 10, uh, only three out of 10 show some, uh, some fever. So fever is really not um, the, the solution. Uh, I mean, it may help, but it's not the solution for that. Uh, potential solutions are really using uh, passive monitoring of uh, um, physiological signals that we can collect with smartwatches or other devices. Several studies have uh, started since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I mentioned here two very uh, big international studies, uh, a great study from the Robert Koch Institute in Germany, uh, who is, uh, which is collecting data from more than uh, 500,000 uh, uh, um, uh, people, uh, individuals in Germany, uh, mostly physiological data to try to figure out what is the pattern of COVID. Uh, on the other side, we have um, another very large study uh, done in, in China with really similar uh, similar goals. So, um, in, in this talk, I'll, I'll present also our study and what are specifically our goals, and our objectives, and what we've reached so far. Uh, at this point, I would like to do really a step back and uh, describe a little bit, um, you know, everything we can do with this kind of approach, and then, um, you know, contextualize a little bit on how we can propose a solution for. Uh, COVID-19. So um, for this goal, well, we should start talking really about digital medicine. Digital medicine means uh, using digital tools uh, to upgrade, uh, in some sense, medicine. Um, so we need to propose solution in the medical uh, field. So there are three big uh, pillars, in, in my view, uh, in digital medicine. Uh, one of them is the use of biosensors, or this portable devices that uh, can help digitalize human beings. Uh, so basically quantifying parameters for uh, a human and uh, using them, these parameters to, uh, to learn more about uh, uh, these individuals. The interpretation of, uh, of the signals uh, is done through artificial intelligence. So it becomes impossible to really manually process this huge amount of data that we can collect with the sensors. And so AI at that point really becomes fundamental uh, to analyze these uh, signals. And the third aspect, um, which should not be forgotten, is uh, uh, we should focus on the individual. So it's, uh, it's easy in this large amount of data to just say, well, let's, let's see what works in general for a large population. Uh, but we really need to, uh, at the end, go back to the individual and see uh, changes on an individual and how different individuals uh, uh, you know, uh, may react in a different way. Uh, this, is, this is nothing new. This goes back to uh, Hippocrates, the very beginning of medicine. He said that we should focus on, on the person and understand the characteristic of the person before uh, we can focus on, on, on the disease. Uh, the same disease may have a completely different effect as we see for COVID-19 on different individuals. So, um, well, uh, this really calls for a large collaboration. Uh, we have technical people like us, computer scientists and engineers on, on one side, uh, but we should involve and collaborate with uh, healthcare providers, but especially clinical researchers. And uh, since we are uh, you know, working with individuals, also behavioral scientists and ethicists that can help them design these big, large projects. So, uh, Let's look now at these three big aspects. And uh, I would like to start with uh, artificial intelligence and seeing what, we, uh, what, what is happening there. And then we'll look at biosensor and at the end we'll focus on the, uh, on the individual. So uh, artificial intelligence, well, um, 
First, the classical uh, use of artificial intelligence in, in medicine uh, involves really the analysis of, uh, of, of images. So there are clinical figures like a radiologist, a dermatologist, or a pathologist who spend most of their career in interpreting images and uh, diagnosing people uh, just looking at a lot of uh, images. Uh, we know that uh, AI and in particular deep learning uh, provides great solution for analyzing images. The two, I would say, are almost classical um, works um, that, that really show uh, the effectiveness of deep learning are uh, one on focusing on diabetic retinopathy in retinal spondus uh, images. Uh, basically, uh, this work just uh, deals with uh, looking at images of the inner part of, of your eye and uh, trying to detect and diagnose diabetic retinopathy. It has been shown, this is, uh, um, uh, it has been shown that uh, the performance of deep, uh, deep learning in this case are compared with uh, board certified ophthalmologists. Uh, on the other side, another classical work has been done on skin cancer and uh, uh, it has been shown that, uh, again, deep learning is um, unfair with board certified dermatologists. So uh, this is great. We can basically reproduce uh, the work of uh, um, an expert clinician. Uh, there are, we can actually do something more, um, two aspects. On, on one side, uh, we can do more in learning new features uh, that, uh, that a clinician uh, does not know. So uh, this is a paper from 2018 uh, showing, uh, again, in the case of uh, retinal spondus images, uh, this, uh, is it, show it is showing that we can not only you know, do the same job as uh, an ophthalmologist, uh, but we can do something more. And in this particular case, we are able to detect uh, the gender of, of this individual based on the retinal spondus image. Uh, this is actually quite exceptional as, uh, as uh, an ophthalmologist cannot do, does not know what are, um, what are the features that determine gender by just looking at this image. So um, this is uh, actually showing how deep learning can learn something completely new by looking at labeled data, uh, something that we just don't know uh, so far. And of course, we can reuse these technologies um, in particular to uh, diagnose people in remote locations uh, through simple tools and uh, wireless connectivity. We can send uh, this, the same image. Uh, we're still in the example of the retinal spondus images through a smartphone. Uh, this was uh, a work dealing with that uh, just published uh, about a year ago uh, in 2019. So, uh, AI is great. Uh, let's uh, focus now on a more um, specific uh, example um, that we've been working on. So AI is great on, uh, on images, but let's look at a different type of, of signal um, that, that actually goes on uh, longitudinally also. So um, the clinical case here is uh, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is um, basically an abnormal rhythm from, from your heart. And uh, what we are trying to do here is to detect this abnormal rhythm. This is intermittent. Uh, often people are in AFib or let's say about um, one to 5% of, of, of the time. And uh, so it's, uh, the, the monitoring needs to be longitudinal. Um, on the other side, clinically, this is a really serious problem as uh, it brings a five-fold increase in the risk of stroke. Um, it is often undiagnosed as there are no symptoms. Um, often it is discovered really at the moment of, of a stroke. Uh, it's very common, especially for people 65 plus of age. And on the other side, um, it is really important to detect it uh, with, with, um, with, with our tools. 
as a simple anticoagulation therapy is really effective to reduce uh, the risk of stroke. So uh, how do we approach this, uh, this problem? Well, first of all, we are dealing with uh, the electrical signal from the heart, which is uh, basically a time series. Uh, it has been shown uh, that uh, um, um, uh, that deep learning is working great. Also here, this is a great work from um, a group in, uh, at Stanford um, published in 2019 that has been able to uh, look basically at this time series and uh, classify uh, 14 different type of, of arrhythmias with, uh, with deep learning. Um, an even more, a more recent and uh, extremely interesting work has been done by uh, this group at my Mayo Clinic, uh, in which they really looked at prediction, not only detection of, uh, uh, of AFib. Basically, uh, this group instead is looking at uh, um, a 12-lead ECG, which is basically an ECG you can do inside the clinic. Um, it is a really short exam. It lasts only, uh, the signal really lasts only 10 seconds. So it's really unlikely that it overlaps uh, with an, an AFib event for uh, most individuals. So it's really important to see if in these signals, uh, if there are features uh, that could help predicting uh, AFib, even if AFib is not uh, present at the moment. So even if the person is in normal sinus rhythm, so for a, a cardiologist, nothing is really apparent, uh, but deep learning is trying to predict if this uh, same individual will add a field later on. And uh, that, this is a really interesting uh, uh, work um, on this published in, published in The Lancet. Um, our contribution to this field um, has been uh, still in the classification of different rhythms uh, from normal sinus rhythm to a fib or other arrhythmias. And uh, this is a work done on a public data set that is available uh, to uh, Physionet. Uh, we looked in particular at uh, the slightly different uh, question. We looked at uh, what is the additional contribution of deep learning with respect to what we already know? So what we already know is, uh, well, there are a long list of features that are commonly used by cardiologists to uh, distinguish between these different rhythms and detect um, atrial fibrillation. And uh, we uh, implemented really all these uh, features and we compare them with the representation learning approach in which we just feed the um, deep learning algorithm with, uh, um, with the signal and let the algorithm really learn uh, the most important features. Um, a lot of details, this is uh, work published in uh, IEEE computers. Uh, we, we used a, a slightly different approach than the classical one. Uh, the classical one is to move this time series in a time frequency domain and then analyze the image with normal, uh, with standard deep learning techniques. Uh, instead, uh, we decided to, uh, to look at the time series uh, as a one-dimensional signal. So we basically modified uh, the uh, deep learning architecture to work with, uh, with that kind of signals. Um, long story short, we used uh, five different um, architectures, AlexNet, BGG, Inception, ResNet, and MobileNet. And uh, uh, let's quickly look at the results. So uh, two main results here. Uh, one is on the uh, bottom left, and uh, we are comparing here uh, deep learning uh, with uh, expert features. Uh, so these manual features as recognized by um, cardiologists, which are in orange here. So it's, it's really evident here, it's really clear what is and this precision recall um, graph. What is the advantage of using deep learning? What is the delta model? Yep. That, I'm sorry, that we are able to learn with, uh, um, with uh, deep learning. Uh, um, I think there is some, 
some noise in the background. Okay. Yep. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, uh, on the on the top right here, uh, instead, we, you can see a comparison between uh, the five different architectures. Um, interestingly, we compared it uh, in uh, four different dimensions. Uh, the accuracy is one thing, uh, but there are some other aspects that are really important. Also, the memory and computational efficiency, and most important of all, the data efficiency. So how much data do we need to really learn this? Uh, uh, to, to really learn um, the the, um, uh, the classification. So um, uh, on data efficiency in particular, mobile net uh, seems to um, to work better uh, than the other four techniques, uh, at least uh, for this data set. Uh, so that has been the one we have chosen and the one we have uh, looked at the performance of. So if you're interested in more details, uh, let me know or please get a look at the uh, IEEE computer uh, publication. So, um, well, this is great on, on AI. Um, let's, uh, let's not forget the most interesting dimension here. Um, uh, the most interesting dimension is really the longitudinal dimension. So the analysis of uh, this very long uh, type of data, um, as we said, um, focusing really on a short 10 seconds uh, measurements that we can do inside the clinic is just not enough. We need to look at long data and uh, what we can learn uh, from, from this long data. So this really goes back to, well, we should probably use less detailed, uh, but much longer uh, type of uh, signals as the one we can collect with uh, uh, for example, a smartwatch or a portable device. Um, along this line, uh, there have been two uh, extremely famous uh, uh, studies, the Apple Heart Study, uh, uh, sponsored by Apple, who uh, recruited about uh, 400,000 uh, participants. And uh, we're really looking at the detection of, uh, of AFib um for this participant that uh, we're wearing a smartwatch uh, a very similar study has been done also by huawei uh, with about 200,000 individuals with the same goal and both these studies is really looking at a, an extremely large population and trying to figure out um, how can we use these signals for um, detecting afib so um this is indeed only so it's a super interesting uh, dimension. We have seen how AI can help and how uh, important it is, uh, this longitudinal um, aspects of this data. Um, now, oh, let's, let's try to go back to the biosensor and what other type of signals can we collect with these uh, simple devices and uh, how we can use it uh, in, in practice uh, to make a change in, in, in medicine. So um, I have a, a few examples here from blood pressure to sleep to resting heart rate. And um, we'll, we'll just go through them and then we'll, uh, we'll see how they can be applied then, uh, for the COVID emergency. So the first example is blood pressure. So a little bit of a background. Uh, well, uh, we all know that uh, high blood pressure, um, which is hypertension, is uh, a, a, you know, a big contributor to morbidity and mortality worldwide. It has been shown that uh, by lowering blood pressure um, can really have an impact in reducing the risk of stroke. Um, now, the main problem um, that, that we see in, um, in, in how commonly blood pressure is measured is this is, a, again, a one-time measurement um, and see the parallel for uh, what we have done with ECG. This is a one-time measurement that you do inside the clinic. Um, and, uh, you know, based on the values recorded, you're classified in one of those four classes here, normal prehypertension or hypertension one or two. Uh, 
and uh, you know eventually a therapy is designed uh, based on uh, where you are now this is uh, this goes a little bit of a problem for a few reasons one is uh, inside the clinic, usually you are a little bit tense, and so your blood pressure tends to be higher than your normal uh, blood pressure. And uh, most importantly, uh, blood pressure is fluctuating a lot for any individual over a day. And just looking at one value at a specific time may not be, uh, may not really give uh, an, an accurate idea of what is happening uh, during the day for that individual. So, um, we looked here um, at, uh, at the large data set of uh, 16 million blood pressure measurements uh, from 56,000 uh, uh, subjects. And uh, it's a work published in uh, IEEE uh, JBHI a couple of years ago. Um, um, the, this, this data set is really rich. Uh, it's distributed, as you see here on the left, and um, from young people to um, old people, uh, 80 plus. And uh, these people have a, a, a broad range of, of blood pressure, um, from really low blood pressure with uh, um, uh, systolic blood pressure uh, under 100 uh, on average uh, to some other individuals with a really high blood pressure of 170 and, and more on, on average. So. Um, any individual here takes the blood pressure measure several times. And uh, what we noticed is really that for people who, uh, you know, consistently take the blood pressure several times for um, 15 or 30 minutes, uh, there is a, a huge decrease in blood pressure as a matter of a couple of minutes from the initial measurement. And uh, this is huge as, uh, well, the average decrease after 15 minutes is about uh, uh, seven, between seven and eight uh, millimeter of mercury, which, which is uh, a big value for, uh, for blood pressure. Um, this is the decrease in the systolic blood pressure. Uh, it's a big value as uh, you can think that uh, 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 a low sodium diet, which is what is suggested if you have a high blood pressure, um, usually, um, uh, brings a decrease in blood pressure of about five millimeter of mercury. So seven or eight is really a lot. And uh, if we divide actually between, um, we classify basically people based on the initial measurements, so, uh, this uh, drop is even more substantial. If the initial measurement for an individual is in the hypertension 2 class, the most dangerous one, uh, by waiting about 15 minutes, we have an average over this 56,000 people, an average decrease of about 15 millimeter of mercury. So blood pressure is, uh, is uh, one interesting measure uh, that we can measure over time. Uh, there are many others. Uh, let's get a look at the second one. Uh, let's get a look at sleep. So, uh, well, uh, Sleep, uh, we all know how important it is for our life. And uh, uh, the, the classical uh, clinical way to measure sleep, uh, if you have any sleep problem, is uh, what you see here in this, uh, this figure. Um, the, this, this man is actually going to a polysomnography, which is an, an, an exam uh, that you do inside the clinic. And uh, you really have uh, this a uh, lot of um, cables all, all over you um, and uh, a lot of cables also um, connected to your nose and uh, on different parts of your head. Uh, the, the one night uh, that you need to spend inside the clinic is really, well, on, on one side it is, uh, of course, expensive. Uh, on the other side, uh, it is really uh, not, not pleasant. Um, you are sleeping in a different environment and uh, um, you, you can really not move with all these cables all around. And, uh, actually, if you move, uh, most likely one cable goes out of place and they wake you up basically to uh, fix it. So, um, I'd say non-ideal and uh, it's a really deep exam, uh, but of course it's not representative of your average night of sleep. And uh, once more, uh, this is a one shot. So this is one night uh, measured 
it's not a longitudinal measure of what is happening. Of course, with wearable sensors, you can do um, a different, uh, uh, you have a completely different dimensionality. This is uh, a study we have done with uh, a retrospective study with 200,000 individuals. Um, and we have been looking at their sleep um, over the course of two years. And uh, what, what you see here is really their average sleep. And, uh, and it is compared with uh, um, self-reported sleep uh, by the CDC. The CDC is an institute uh, of health in uh, disease prevention, really, in, uh, in the U.S. And uh, that data in, in blue uh, is the average sleep as, uh, as it is asked with, uh, uh, with telephone interviews to about 400,000 people. Um, and uh, you see that, well, approximately this, that seems that there is an overestimation of what you think you're really sleeping, uh, while with uh, a more objective measure with these devices, it seems that the average sleep is, is more towards seven hours or, or less, uh, not really eight or, or more. So uh, this is, um, this is uh, uh, well, and this is a more um, precise um, histogram of really what is the uh, distribution of the average sleep over this very large population. Now, uh, this is a population study. Uh, what I'm really interested in is uh, the individual uh, sleeps. Uh, as you see here, these are the distribution of sleep for uh, four individuals. Um, and. Um, that's really amazing on how different uh, this looks uh, from one individual to another. So these four individuals have uh, more or less the same um, average sleep, but if we see an individual on, on the left, um, he or she is, is sleeping really anywhere between five and 10 hours, different nights uh, when she or she has been monitored. The second individual instead is a really uh, you know, specific sleep time around seven hours per night. And the two individuals on the right seems to have an almost bimodal uh, mode of sleeping. Uh, most likely uh, this is connected to uh, you know, your sleep during uh, weekdays and during weekends. Uh, the one on the right, for example, seems that uh, he or she is sleeping either around six hours uh, for certain days or around eight or nine hours for some other days. Uh, why is this important? This is extremely important as if we are looking at changing in the sleep pattern as, as we are doing uh, for, for the COVID, we really need to keep this into account. We cannot look at the population base and just set a threshold, uh, but we really need to look at individual changes uh, also in sleep. So we need to understand what is the sleep pattern for an individual before and then trying to see if there is any anomaly, uh, which may be, for example, uh, connected to, uh, to an infection. Um, well, the most interesting uh, parameter that uh, we have been analyzing, um, in my opinion, is really this uh, daily uh, resting heart rate. Um, this is, uh, well, another paper uh, published this time in uh, PLOS One. Uh, this is a, a publication back in February of this year, in which we have been looking at uh, daily resting heart rate for this uh, large population, in this retrospective study. Uh, a couple of things. So first, from a population point of view, um, well, let me, let me define uh, first what a daily resting heart rate is. This is the value of your uh, heart rate just before you wake up in the morning as uh, recorded by, uh, by your smartwatch or um, portable device. Um, this, is, uh, um, this, is, this is a really interesting parameter as uh, this is quite constant for an individual. It's not affected by the specific activity uh, you're doing or not much by your stress level during the day. And uh, the change in uh, when it changes, uh, it means that something is happening. Um, the daily resting heart rate uh, may change a lot 
for different individuals, uh, the figure here show the distribution of the average uh, resting heart rate uh, for 92,000 individuals. And you see that some individuals have a daily resting heart rate of less than uh, 50 pulls per minute, some other of 90 or 90 plus pulls per minute. Um, so there is a huge variability, uh, but for an individual, it's, it's actually quite, uh, quite constant. And let's look here at, uh, in particular, three individuals. Um, so the one on the left uh, has um, a really constant resting heart rate over the course of 12 months, so one year. Uh, a resting heart rate that goes anywhere between 66 and 70 pulls per minute, uh, but you know, very small changes over, over the course of 12 months. The second individual instead is, uh, is really interesting. So uh, he or she have a resting heart rate that uh, changes approximately between 64 and 70 pulls per minute, but it has one peak that is more than 80 pulls per minute happening by the end of uh, February in this case. So uh, oh, what does that mean? Uh, well, that could be connected uh, with, with a week in which something exceptional is happening to this individual that may be connected to, to an infection, as, as we'll see in a minute. Um, the third individual that we see on the right here uh, it's also really interesting. Uh, what is happening here is you see this periodicity. This is most probably um, a women, as we uh, we figured out that the resting heart rate is actually related to the menstrual cycle. So it's changing on, on a monthly basis. And then uh, it shows, uh, again, by uh, the beginning of November, in this case, um, a kind of a higher peak of about 8 pulls per minute. Now, we should notice that uh, for this individual, if we imagine that they are monitoring their resting heart rate, all of a sudden they see, well, uh, I'm, I usually have 65, now I have I'm 80 pulls per minute, so maybe I should go to the doctor and see if something is happening. Uh, well, um, if you go to the doctor and say my resting heart rate is 80 pulls per minute, uh, the doctor most probably would say, well, that's totally normal, is in the range of normal resting heart rate for uh, people of your age. Um, the main issue here is that this is not normal for this individual. So again, uh, we, we, we really need to go back to the individual. And uh, this is normal for a population. For that individual, this really shows that something exceptional is happening and that we need to react in some way. Uh, as this is just a value not normal for the individual. So uh, let's go even deeper on this resting heart rate. Well, um, really, uh, resting heart rate is also changing. And now we go back to a population level as changing um, over the course of the year. We notice a really interesting trend uh, that uh, the resting heart rate reaches a minimum in the summer around July and August, again, averaging over this large population. And uh, there is a fluctuation and it reaches a maximum really on the last week uh, of the Christmas holiday. Uh, and again, there's a really interesting result as uh, they are validated over this very large population of 90,000 plus individuals. Uh, so after the last week of the Christmas holiday, there is uh, an interesting um, steep decrease really in, uh, in the resting heart rate, a potential link with uh, the New Year resolution. And uh, resting heart rate is also uh, connected with, uh, with age, uh, with your body mass uh, index. And uh, uh, a really interesting figure here is uh, panel D, uh, in which we are representing the standard deviation of the resting heart rate for uh, men in this light blue and women in green. And as you see here, the standard deviation, so the the variation over the year of this uh, resting heart rate is much higher for women with respect to men, at least till the age of, uh, of 50. This is, uh, again, women in childbearing age, uh, and uh, this variation may be uh, connected to uh, variation due to the menstrual cycle. 
so another um, aspect that we should consider uh, when we analyze for an individual the uh, resting heart rate. Now, um, I mentioned several times how this can be, uh, big changes can be related to, um, to an infection. And uh, this is uh, really the topic of, of this study uh, by my colleague, uh, Jennifer Radin. Um, this is a, um, a work published uh, last uh, uh, January. Uh, interestingly, uh, just before uh, the starting of, of this pandemic, and uh, it's published in the Lancet Digital Health, and really uh, studies the correlation between uh, changing and the resting heart rate and uh, the occurrence of uh, on a population basis on a state level in particular here we see figures from california and texas um, uh, she basically correlated changes in resting heart rate on a population level and the occurrence of uh, influenza like illness um, so the rate of influenza-like illness is provided by the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, uh, or, or, which basically uh, gives us the number of uh, cases, uh, recorded cases of influenza-like illnesses. And uh, there is really a strong correlation. Uh, we are able to follow up this path really well. So this basically tells us that changes in resting heart rate and uh, sleep uh, can uh, help preventing, uh, can help predicting actually this, uh, um, this occurrences. Um, the cases uh, estimated by the CDC are uh, reported with a delay of approximately two weeks. Uh, so we can have uh, this information about two weeks before um, the goal here was really for influenza-like illnesses. As you can imagine, the same exact uh, uh, type of algorithms can be applied now for COVID. And we can look at the population level or we can look at an individual level and trying to see if these changes can really help us uh, detecting COVID potentially before uh, symptoms or uh, an actual test in test is, uh, has been done on the, on the individual. This is uh, really the motivation for our DETECT uh, platform. And the big question uh, here is, what is normal? Um, as I showed you, resting heart rate can vary for an individual anywhere between 50 and 90 pulse per minute, depending on the individual. Um, but we really need to figure out, uh, you know, in which stage this is your normal resting heart rate, in which stage it is not. As, as you see in the figure here, um, over about 90 days, uh, for this individual, uh, a normal resting heart rate between 62 and 68 pulse per minute uh, just becomes abnormal at, at some point around uh, day uh, 50 or 55 of this monitoring time and goes up to approximately 80 pulse per minute. Again, this is not abnormal in general for a population basis. This is abnormal for that individual and may be connected with infections um, uh, or uh, influenza-like illness or COVID-19 for, uh, for that individual. So uh, this really motivated DETECT, uh, this platform um, that we have done at Scripps Research in collaboration uh, with our software partner called uh, Carevolution um, that really developed the, uh, the platform for this study. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, there is a website, detectstudy.org, uh, that can tell you more information about that. And if you are in, uh, you can participate in the study on the, um, uh, for now at least, only if you are uh, from uh, the United States. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to expand uh, worldwide. Um, how does the study work? Uh, well, basically, uh, an app allows you to passively share your the data from your wearable device, your smartwatch or activity tracker, and uh, you can share eventual uh, symptoms that you're experiencing and uh, test results, uh, of course, that, uh, if you're um, going for a test. Uh, you have also the option to share your uh, medical, uh, medical records. Um, 
if you choose to do so. Um, the study uh, became quite big. Um, it was started uh, back in March, and uh, we enrolled so far about 35,000 individuals. Um, we really spread it all uh, the United States. Uh, we have a participant from uh, each state. Um, the largest number of participants are from big states like California with more than 5,000, Texas, Florida, and uh, New York. Um, and uh, the study uh, really became possible thanks to a uh, great partnership with Fitbit, Walgreens, and CBS uh, that really helped us in the outreach. Uh, so in really reaching out to 35,000 uh, individuals. Now, what we can do uh, with, uh, with this data? So the first thing is really to figure out uh, what is changing uh, for people uh, with, uh, with COVID. So uh, what I'm showing here are some preliminary results uh, looking at uh, people who uh, tested for COVID or uh, on the right here tested for flu and showing uh, statistically at least what is the differences uh, between these people. So the um, uh, first thing is a number of steps. Um, this is normalized uh, values, but we show that uh, the, the median really didn't change much for people that tested negative for COVID-19 or even people who tested either positive or negative for flu. Uh, there is a, a, a quite significant decrease in, step, in number of steps for people who tested positive for COVID-19. Um, this is the value for resting heart rate. Um, and well, let me, let me pause for a second. Uh, what we are doing here is we are looking at changing for the individual. So we are looking basically first for each individual, calculate a baseline, and then we see how much did it change uh, with uh, um, in, in the week in which they reported the uh, symptom and the testing. So um, these are all symptomatic people. And what you, what you see here is the relative change for that individual uh, in, uh, in the week in which they reported symptoms and, and testing with respect to the individual baseline. Uh, so we do the same for resting heart rate. Uh, we show basically a change in resting heart rate for all uh, four cohorts. And it seems that the change is uh, slightly larger for uh, people that tested positive for COVID-19. And uh, we did the same thing for uh, quantity of sleep. And also here we showed uh, a difference really uh, for people that tested positive in COVID-19. Now, uh, how did we use this preliminary results? Well, um, uh, the main idea is, uh, well, we already have some work, uh, which is the work done um, that I mentioned at the beginning by this group in the UK that looked at symptoms and based on symptoms, try to discriminate between COVID positive and COVID negative. Uh, they showed a uh, significant uh, area under the curve of about 0 0.76. But they basically showed that it is possible by looking at symptoms only to discriminate between COVID positive and COVID negative. Um, with sensors, uh, we can do uh, something better. So we can still use symptoms and improve this discrimination. So basically making the discrimination between positive and negative more accurate. And this is really what we are trying to do here. And uh, I, I hope actually uh, we'll be able to, uh, we're still on a preliminary basis, but uh, we'll, we'll add some really concrete results uh, quite soon. Um, Regarding uh, this, this work, uh, well, it received quite a bit of attention from, from the press uh, in, in the United States. Uh, these are just some uh, examples of that. Uh, most recent, uh, it was discussed also in, in the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, um, well, these are a, a bunch of uh, um, um, preprint um, of, of our works and our similar work 
from our colleagues, for example, from Stanford. Um, of course, a preprint does not mean uh, too much. Um, it's, um, you know, the, the real value will be brought with peer reviewed journals. Uh, uh, interesting enough, uh, I see that uh, there are about uh, only in MedArchive, which is the preprint for uh, medical studies uh, on COVID-19, there are something between 50 and 100 new papers per day. So um, yeah, it's really difficult uh, to, uh, to, to extract the most valuable papers from, from there so far. So um, I think we are uh, a little bit over time. Uh, let me try to conclude uh, this talk. Um, going back to, to the main message um, I want to, to bring with this talk. So uh, really uh, what we can do with, with digital medicine. And I go back to the, to the three main pillars that we introduced at the beginning. On one side, personal sensors. Uh, so there's huge opportunity uh, of passively monitoring uh, a large amount of people. And we're not, not talking anymore about 10 or 100 people, but really 100,000 people uh, that want to participate in a, in a research study, uh, you know, want to contribute with their own data to this research study. Uh, the data is, is really rich, uh, not because it's super accurate, but really because it's long data, it's longitudinal, it, it lasts for years not it's not just a single shot uh, measurement like what you can do in, in the clinic analysis of this long data uh, to extract new information and oh well let's not forget the most one of the most important aspects which is really explainability so that's a huge problem for AI as it's really difficult to interpret how uh, the algorithm comes to this, um, to, to, to any conclusion. Explainability will really help in this direction. But, um, I think this is a topic for a completely uh, new talk, uh, that, um, and a really interesting uh, direction of research. Um, the third aspect, of course, is the individual. So, uh, the importance of focusing on the individual, uh, not just looking at general trends, but really understanding uh, what changes are significant for an individual, um, what changes are, um, how can we use these changes to really provide some uh, useful information to the individual. Um, I cannot stress enough how this work is possible only thanks to a tight collaboration uh, between really different expertise. So on one side, uh, more technical people like us from sensor engineers, signal processing experts, or uh, people focusing on AI and deep learning uh, really on the software side. And uh, clinical research needs to be included and, and in the loop from the very beginning, as they can guide and can really understand and help interpret uh, any result that comes out from, uh, from this research. And uh, if I can add also, uh, let's not forget that we need to work with individuals. So uh, we also need to figure out uh, to provide value to the individual and motivate the individual in participating in the research. Um, again, well, we are not uh, uh, looking at uh, 10 or 20 individuals, but we're really looking at a large population that would allow us to do uh, you know, great discoveries and really helping uh, at digital medicine and, uh, well, in particular, uh, in COVID-19 for now. Um, really, a last word on, on COVID-19. Uh, this detect and all the studies are focused on this uh, pandemic, but re they really want to become a tool uh, for future uh, flu epidemics or for any type of new epidemics that will happen in the future to really help from the beginning uh, with new tools uh, to uh, potentially stop or alleviate uh, the negative outcomes of this, uh, of, of, of any pandemic. So this really concludes my, uh, my talk. Uh, I want to Thank you all for uh, listening and for 
participating in this talk and uh, I'm open to any questions. Uh, thanks a lot. So, sorry, uh, was it a question? I, I didn't hear. Um. Beatrice, uh, Inko, should we? I can't hear it. I. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That uh, that is that is a great point. Um, of course. Um, there are big changes uh, just because of the lockdown, uh, potentially not because of COVID-19 uh, in, uh, in activity, but also uh, the quantity of sleep, for example, that we're also using in our prediction algorithm. So um, the main idea here is uh, to do a fair comparison. So uh, we compare people who tested positive um, against people who tested uh, uh, negative for COVID-19 uh, in the same um, in the same time period, so um, while um, I, I cannot really uh, say explicitly uh, how much of this is uh, due to the lockdown, how much is needed to, is is due to to the illness. Uh, what I can say is, well, um, let's let's be blind for that, and let's uh, the algorithm learn really if uh, um, if we can still distinguish between these people. Um, between positive and negative. As soon as the comparison is done in a, in a fair way, uh, so uh, not, of course, comparing people um, now with people maybe in, in November of last year, uh, but we compare the same people in the same area and uh, with, uh, at the same time, uh, then we can really say what is uh, yeah, that. If we are able to distinguish between positive and negative, this is really due to COVID, not due to um, the lockdown. Um, so the short answer is really on uh, this is a fair comparison um, that allow us to distinguish that. Okay, yes. Uh, can you hear me now, Giorgio? Uh, sure, yes. Hi, Beatrice. Okay. Yes, hi. <laughs> I was back. Um, okay, so that was the only question, I think, in the, uh, yes, and uh, Vinko, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, or if you had some other questions uh, privately. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I also had a question about uh, uh, how do you see these uh, methods being used uh, uh, together with um, more traditional uh, um, prevention uh, or the diagnostic methods. Um, I know that uh, they are th thinking and they are doing some quick tests for uh, COVID-19 uh, that are also cheaper than the ones that they have them at the moment. So how do you see uh, this uh, being part of, uh, of the studies you're doing as well? Sure. Um... That, that, that's a great question, and uh, um, to, to be super clear, um, so 
this is a part really of, of, of a much bigger uh, solution. So um, this, uh, the platform that we are implementing, of course, cannot substitute uh, testing as it's not a diagnostic test. It's, it's just uh, you know, tell people really potentially what is the probability that uh, they, they may um, be experiencing COVID. This does not substitute testing. Um, we are actually in collaboration uh, with uh, just to, trying to experiment new uh, testing uh, connected with, uh, with our platform. But the main idea here is, um, uh, you know, we cannot test, uh, as I said, everybody uh, every day. Um, uh, so testing needs to be done uh, strategically in, in, in some sense. Um, so um, no matter how uh, potentially may, may be much cheaper than it is now, but still um, testing everybody every day would be a big problem. So uh, our platform would really help us figuring out uh, the people who are at high risk or who showed any changes in their uh, physiological parameters that should be invited to be tested uh, potentially immediately. And then this will work in parallel with a periodic testing, potentially once per, per month or every couple of weeks, uh, really for everybody. Um, um, I think this is um, potentially the vision that, that we have for, for this, for providing a solution. Yeah, thank you. I also had another question about um, individual or personalized medicine that you talked about and and the studies that um, actually use uh, a lot of data, so AI and um, yeah, a large data set. So um, it looks a bit contradictory because you want to do something, I mean, you yeah, you would like to understand something for an individual, but then uh, on the other hand, you are looking at uh, the average uh, and the big um, trends over a big population. So, how do you uh, sure. explain this uh, this part? Sure, these are really uh, I would say two cases of, of of the same of the same problem. Um, uh, on one side, uh, we can provide some uh, results looking at the population. And uh, um, in particular, we need to learn these new methods looking at a large number of, of people. The analysis itself, uh, so the, um, needs to be done at the individual level. Uh, a, a really interesting example is really on this uh, changes, for example, in, in sleep steps or resting heart rate. Mm -hmm. So while we, we learn really uh, on a population basis, uh, what are the uh, what are the significant changes that are related, for example, to uh, the, pos the positivity for COVID? Uh, on, on the other side, the changes need to be calculated at the individual level. So for each individual, we need to do some analysis and comes up with a set of features that are related to specifically to that individual. Uh, for example, uh, you know. Uh, relative change in resting heart rate with respect to the baseline that is defined for that individual. And then uh, we can learn an algorithm uh, that, that looks at these individual features and can uh, discriminate between uh, COVID positive and negative. For that algorithm, of course, we need a large population such that we are um, able to learn from um, and really cut out the noise, let's say. Um, um, so. Uh, they seem contradictory, but in, in reality, there are really two aspects of the same, uh, the same solution. Okay, great. Yes. Um, so it, it looks like we don't have any other questions in the Q&A, but um, uh, this talk was really great. Thank you so much for giving it. Um, and I let maybe Vinko uh, close the the talk. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Beatrice, and uh, thank you so much, everybody, for attending this talk. Uh, if you have further questions, uh, uh, feel free to reach me. Uh, you have my contacts here. Uh, that is my uh, my Twitter and my email. 
uh, in this slide, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll be happy to uh, further discuss on, on this. All right. Thank you very much, Vinko, and thank you very much again, everybody, uh, for attending this talk. Thanks a lot.